Tonight, Nicola Sturgeon has quit. Does that mean Scottish independence is more or less likely as a result? And which political party is most likely to benefit? To discuss that and much more, we're in rugby this evening in the famous public school of the same name, which has been going strong since the 1500s. This constituency has swung between Labour and the Conservatives, but has been under Tory control for over a decade now. Welcome to Question Time. <laughs> On our panel tonight, Robert Jenrick, the UK government's Minister for Immigration. He was elected to Parliament in 2014, winning the Newark by-election. He since served as Housing Secretary under Boris Johnson and was in the health team in the Liz Truss government. Stephen Kinnock is Labour's shadow on immigration. The Welsh MP and son of the former Labour leader, Neil, has represented Aberavon since 2015. He worked at the World Economic Forum before that. If anything of consequence has happened in Scottish politics over the last several decades, then Ruth Wishart has no doubt written and spoken about it. She's been a broadcaster, journalist and commentator across the media scene and is also a long-time supporter of Scottish independence. Lionel Shriver says she's lost friends over her political views but she does have an army of fans for being an award-winning author of her 17 books most notable so far is We Need to Talk About Kevin. She's written for many newspapers and is now a regular columnist for The Spectator. And Ian Hislop has been editor of Private Eye for over 30 years, the best-selling magazine that lampoons and invests in equal measure. He's also been a team captain of TV's <clears throat> second best current affairs panel show. Have I got news for you since it began in 1990? Good evening to our panel, to our audience here, which tonight, because we are in rugby, reflects electoral support for our political parties here in England. And of course, good evening to all of you watching at home. Every Thursday night, Question Time trends on social media, so why not join in? Let's hear what you've got to say and what you're thinking about it all. So, let's take our first question tonight, which is from Simon Rush. Does Nicola Sturgeon resigning as First Minister mean the end of Scottish independence? Ian, why don't you kick yourself? Yeah, obvious first person to come to. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's I an opinion, and that's all we can have. OK. Um, I think, on the whole, um, this side of the border, Nicola Sturgeon gets a fairly easy ride um, in terms of uh, coverage. And a lot of the um, uh, tributes to her uh, seem to me well over the top and not terribly well informed. I mean, she said three weeks ago that uh, she had plenty in the tank and that she was nowhere near quitting. Then she quit. Um, that makes her a standard politician, not a saint. Um, and I do think that um, uh, in terms of independence, I'm sure the movement will go on. There are plenty of people here who will take it on. Um, I think what we'll lose is the cult of personality, which I think will be a good thing. I think it'll be a good thing for Scotland, and I think it'll be a good thing for everyone else. Now, I do mean, you think it makes independence more or less likely? Do you have um, a I think it makes it slightly less likely because, you know, during COVID, she was on the telly every night. She had a pre presidential style, and she had the advantage of having a British Prime Minister who was, you know, an old Etonian Brexiteer, twice. Now, she hasn't got that. So the narrative that everything in Scotland is the fault of English public school boys, it won't wash anymore. Um, and her own loan scandal, I know we've got a dodgy loan scandal at the BBC, but uh, there is a dodgy loan scandal with the SNP, there's the ferries. You know, staggering, staggering waste of money, and there will be an inquiry, I'm sure. There are real issues in Scotland that haven't been addressed at all. And I think, with her gone, they may now be addressed. So that's Ruth? my opinion. Ruth? Well, how much of that can I disagree with in two sentences? Um, first of all, um, you, you said that Nicola Sturgeon got a, a, an easy ride from the, from the media down here. That's a load of cobblers, to use a... Um, a technical phrase because you know I was reading. Yeah, I recognise it. I was, <laughs> I'm sure, I was reading the papers on the way down on the train today, and um, one paper which I won't name because I've only just bought it for the first time today called her that bloody woman, um, and that bloody woman was you know was what they used to call Mrs Thatcher. Nicholas Sturgeon loathed and detested Mrs Thatcher. I think you're right about one thing. Uh, I think the cult of personality is not good for politics. 
But if you remember before uh, Nicola Sturgeon, there was Alex Salmond, and Alex Salmond, when he uh, left politics, or he didn't leave politics, but when he left the leadership of the, of the SNP, everybody said, who on earth could replace Alec? And Nicola came along and... Well, except, hang on, I mean, and Nicola was very much there side by side with Alex, and, she... and that's not the situation now. And the question is, does Nicola Sturgeon resign? And he's not the most distinguished figure in Scottish <laughs> politics to look back on, is he? Does Nicola Sturgeon resigning mean the end of Scottish independence, or certainly does well, it make it less likely? Well, what's your answer to that? I, th I think it, I think it will have an impact. Um, and what do you think that impact will be? Well, f just if I, I could just elaborate very briefly, um, the all the commentators from the unionist parties have said that you know this is a, this is glad tidings of great joy, and um, and they're, they're all dancing on the political grave of Nicola Sturgeon and uh, various people, including some of uh, your colleagues, have said things like you know this is a great gift for the Labour Party. I don't think that's true because if you look at the demographics in Scotland, there's only one age group now which unhappily as my age group, there's only one age group no, Ruth, in, in which the is you hostile. You haven't answered the question yet. I, well, I am answering the question. Well, are you? I haven't heard it. Does, it. does it mean the end of Scottish independence? Or no. at least does it make it less likely? No, it doesn't mean the end of Scottish independence, and I don't think it makes it less likely. I think there's going to be a period during which, uh, a period of turmoil inevitably until a new leader is picked. But no, because of what I was trying to say in, in response is because um, Almost every age group in Scotland is pro-independence. I don't. I think that will continue. I think the independence movement's got its own momentum. Robert. Well, I don't know is the answer. As a were you glad to see as, a, as a unionist, I hope that it does have uh, an impact on the cause. I think, uh, without question, Nicola Sturgeon was is a very significant figure in Scottish politics and and public life. Um, but I think she rather like. Um, you heard from Ian, she leaves behind her no shortage of problems which uh, her and the SNP have failed to tackle. You do see in Scotland today life expectancy falling. It's the lowest of any of the nations of the United Kingdom. You see education standards falling when once we look to Scotland as having some of the highest educational standards, and what you was see the drug death soaring. What was the response in government when she resigned? Because it took a lot of people by surprise. Were you cheering? Or were you thinking, no, oh, I, I, I'm I, not worried I, about who's coming no, next? I don't think anyone was cheering. I think people, and anyone who serves in office, whether that's in uh, the cabinet or leading a devolved administration, can understand that whilst it's an enormous privilege to hold these positions, it does carry with it some burden, particularly if you're your family and loved ones. So I think I and others understand why Nicola Surgeon might want to move on. But what, what we would like to see in government is that this new phase that Scottish politics now moves into is one which is more unifying than the very divisive one that we've lived through since the referendum. And that we in Westminster, as the government of the United Kingdom, can work as productively and constructively as possible with the Scottish government whether that's led by the SNP or anybody else, to tackle the issues that actually matter okay. to the public Let's in Scotland and not be distracted by these okay. constitutional questions which have just proved incredibly divisive. Man there in the blue suit. I share the view with uh, a former Lord Advocate that the Treaty of Union, as an international treaty, is in perpetuity and cannot be broken in any event, so independence should constitutionally never happen. OK, woman here in the blue sweater. I think, I think when you look at the, the planning and all the discussion that's gone on, I do question whether they actually have a vision of how it would look to be um, separated from the UK. This is the SNP you're talking about. In the SNP. And I think, I think they, there isn't one. I'm not seeing a clear one. OK. Stephen? I, Nicola Sturgeon was an impressive politician, or is. I mean, I'm not talking about the past tense, but as a leader. And the, you know, and the impact and she, on independence. And she gave a, a, a gracious and thought-provoking speech yesterday. I don't think it will make a huge amount of difference, to be frank, because I think support for independence is drifting away in Scotland. Uh, the realisation of the people of Scotland is that Politics is about much more than one single issue, one obsession about one particular narrative. It is about the cost of living crisis. It's about the National Health Service. It's about uh, antisocial behaviour. It's about the bread and butter issues that really matter to people. And I'm afraid that Nicola Sturgeon's 
single-minded obsession with that one issue. The SNP's single-minded obsession has distracted them, as the government of Scotland, from getting on with the people's priorities. And what I really hope is that we will see uh, nationalism as a cause withering on the vine, because in the dangerous and turbulent world in which we live, we need politicians who bring people and communities together, okay. not constantly dividing. And the one thing I would say is at least uh, Nicola Sturgeon had the self-awareness to resign when she realised that she was becoming an electoral liability. What I hope now is that Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister of the UK, will do the same so that we can have a general election and get this <laughs> awful government out of the way so that Labour can take over and get our country yeah. back on track. I'll let you come back in a minute. I can know you want to come in. Let me just ask, are there any... Any people here in this audience, I appreciate that we are in England, but who are supportive of Nicola Sturgeon's view and of the SNP? Obviously, if we were in Scotland, we would see a, a, a fair few hands. But here, but here nobody. OK. Um, let me bring Lionel in. She's not spoken. And then I'll come back to you, Ruth, I promise. Lionel. Well, I think this is a blow for Scottish nationalism, but uh, I don't think we should forget that it's also, uh, and importantly, a blow for radical trans activism which is really what brought her down. Uh, I thought that her resignation, uh, while fulsome, was disingenuous, uh, that uh, suddenly, whereas four months ago she was raring to go on to the next election, uh, suddenly she was too exhausted. Uh, I find that dishonest because it was clear that things were going badly for her, and most importantly, this a gender, gender self ID bill was wildly unpopular in, in Scotland uh, as well as in the rest of the UK. And I've, I would have admired her more if she had simply acknowledged that and said, this is not going my way, this is bringing down my party. Uh, and obviously it had cross-party support at Holyrood. Yes, but it did not have popular support. It had very little popular support. And... Um, and I just, I, I, have to, I have to say, I, as a woman, I find the I'm simply too tired uh, reason for quitting uh, a bit girly. OK, yeah. Ruth, you'll be desperate. Let me get the audience. I promise I am going to let you come in. I promise. Let me just hear a bit more of the audience. Yes, the woman there in the white shirt. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the things that scares me the most is, yet again, the headlines are about a politician stepping down rather than the important issues like the state of our National Health Service and immigration at the moment. I'm sure Nicola Sturgeon will agree that there's more important things to talk about on national news than the fact that she's stepping down and someone else is just going to take over. OK. Ruth, you're desperate to come back in. I Please am, do. B because it, it, all of the, the reaction to this and across the media, uh, certainly across the, the, the English media, has been that um, the Scottish National Party and the government who are in government in Scotland, and I'm not a member of any party, but the Scottish National Party who are in government in Scotland keep being accused of being obsessed with independence. I mean, the party was founded in order to get independence for Scotland. It seems very strange that people think that a party founded to get independence is obsessed with getting independence. I mean, that's its raison d'etre. That was why it, it came about. And Lionel, I mean, too girly, come on. I mean, I, do, I happen to agree with you on GRR, and I happen not to agree with Nicola Sturgeon, as it happens. But, you know, when Jacinda Ardern, uh, Ardern uh, resigned, Ardern, and, and, yeah. and, uh, and thank you, <laughs> and Nicola Sturgeon resigned, um, both of them went at a time of their own choosing, which I think is unusual for a politician, and it's quite important that, it, uh, that they were able to do that and they were able to trust their own instincts and go at a time of their choosing. I think that matters, and I don't think it was anything to do with them being women. I venture to suggest that some male MPs, uh, we mentioned one um, in Pasig, Mr Johnson, had to be dragged cricking and screaming out of number 10. I mean, Maybe the male ego had something to do with it, and maybe the female ego is a little less fragile. She survived eight years and seven as deputy. She didn't suddenly feel tired, did she? No, she didn't suddenly feel tired, but I think... She the also left saying, classically said, most people in Scotland agree with me that um, there should be independence. Now, as a definition of most... What are the polls at the moment? Just well, the, over 50-50? The polls, 50? The poll, well, I'm glad you asked me that because the polls have just, just moved uh, to 47 to 53 in favour of right. no, but, but, but a month so it's ago... Not, it's not a huge majority, but is a, it? No, it's not. And I think she recognises, and I think most people, including me, recognise that there has to be a, a significant 
um, majority in favour mm. of independence before we can contemplate again. I get that. I really do get that. But, okay. but it's been 50-50 for maybe the last six or seven years now, certainly since 2014. And let's remember that when David Cameron went to the country with a breakfast, a breakfast? <laughs> Probably that too. A dog's when, when, breakfast, when he went, yeah. When he, when he, when I was waiting for someone to, to say that. Yeah. Yeah. A dog's breakfast. I yeah, well, he had it. two referendums, both of which were utterly <laughs> useless. Yes, but the point okay. is that he went to on a Brexit re referendum on 36.9% of the population. That was the, the, the percentage that elected him. And now... Um, you know, Nicola Sturgeon has won eight uh, elections in a row and suddenly that's not mandate enough? No, no, right. but it's not the elections winning. It's, it's the number of people who agree with independence as the only issue. And if it's 50-50, you're going to end up with a Brexit situation in Scotland over the single most important issue. And, you know, it's, it's been terrific in the UK, Brexit, you've probably noticed. OK. Um, okay. I get and so we've got another union to break up. All right. I'm going to move on. But before I do, I want to mention that Question Time is in Cardiff next week. The week after that, we're in Sunderland. So Cardiff and then Sunderland. If you'd like to come to either show, go to the Question Time website. Address is here. And we'd love to see you. Just follow the instructions there and come along. Right, let's take another question now from... And you'll be, the lady in the white shirt, you'll be glad we're taking this question. Debbie Lynn. With the recent protests at an asylum seekers hotel in Merseyside, do you think having a clear working asylum policy would solve the problem? Well, rather handily, we have the Immigration Minister and Shadow Immigration Minister here, so let's get it from the horses' mouths. Robert. Well, the first thing to say about the protests uh, that happened in Nodesley is that it's always unacceptable to break the law, and there is no excuse whatsoever for the violence that we saw in Merseyside. But to understand is not to condone, and there are some who see the public's frustration about the small boats crossing the channel as a sort of phenomenon to be managed and not as a warning to be heeded, and we don't agree. We think that it is absolutely vital that we as a country get a grip on this issue. We live in an age of mass migration. The United Nations has said there's over 100 million people on the move today, many of whom obviously would want to come to the UK as one of the most prosperous countries in the world. So how do you, how do you propose to resolve it? I mean, there has been a, a report recently, and, and the Home Secretary wrote the, the foreword mm. to this report. It's made a number of suggestions, one of which was introducing laws making it impossible to claim asylum in the UK at all after travelling from a safe country. Is that something you endorse and would like to see come in? It, it is. So there would be what, no way the, the of claiming way, asylum at all if you came from a safe country? The way we view this is a simple... Just to be clear, that's simple, what you're saying. Let, let me answer your question. Well, you said yes. I was just double-checking. Well, I will, I, will, I, will expand on, I will expand on that. The way we view this is that if you come here illegally in a small boat, and remember these are mostly young men leaving France, a safe country, they are soliciting people, smugglers, to ferry them across the channel breaking our laws, they're often throwing their documents into the sea so they can exploit our human rights laws, that that is criminality and that we shouldn't allow that to happen. And so if you come in that form, you will be detained, you will be processed in days or weeks, not months and years, and then you will be removed from the country, either back to where you came from or to a safe third country where you can have your claim handled. And by doing that, we not only tackle criminality, the gangs that feed off it, but we enable this country to target the resources we have, which are finite, the housing, the school places... But that the is different want from on, what you've on, just on, said, Robert, because the question I asked you is, do you support the, the idea, which Suella Bravan, she says she, she doesn't endorse everything in this report, but she has nonetheless written a forward to it, introducing a law to make it impossible to claim asylum in the UK if you have travelled here from a safe country? Yes, yes. The, 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 the asylum and immigration system we want to build, and we're going to be legislating on this shortly, is one where if you come here illegally in breach of our laws, for all the reasons I've described, you will not have a route to life in the UK. That does not mean that we are not a generous and compassionate country. It does not mean that we don't want to help people who are fleeing persecution and war and human rights. Because, of course, some of those people it, who come on small boats we will, we will, will be claiming that. asylum, we'll genuinely. We'll do that, Fiona 
through resettlement schemes, through safe and legal routes, like the ones we've had recently for Ukraine, for Hong Kong, for Syria, for Afghanistan. And that enables us, instead of supporting those people who are in safe countries, like France, to target our resources on helping the people who are most in need in the world. And remember, last year, we issued more humanitarian visas as a country under those schemes than in any year since the end okay. of the Second World Let War. Me get around the so rest we of are doing a lot. And those people who say we're not generous as a country are wrong. We just want to do this in a targeted way that beats the criminal gangs. Right. So we've now got this from the immigration uh, minister that that is the plan to make it impossible to claim asylum in the UK after travelling from a safe country. Your response? Well, it really feels like nothing works in this country after 13 years of Tory failure. There's 7.2 million people on the NHS waiting list, there's a cost of living crisis and the asylum backlog is just part of that story. 166,000 outstanding cases, thousands of people was, in hotels. It was 500,000 when the last no, Labour government that really. Actually, that figure is complete and utter nonsense, well, it uh, Robert. It was, it's it was based on the old cases methodology. The last if you, base, if you look in. at the figures based on the government's own methodology introduced in 2011, the UK, the Labour government in 2010 had less than 20,000 no, uh, outstanding no, cases, so you better get the statistics right well, before the you start is, them around. Well, the question is, with the recent protests... It was worse with them. What about now? No, it, but... It, well, you, hang on, the question is, with the recent protests, do you think having a clear working asylum policy would solve the problem? And if you do, what should it be? Yeah, yes, it, it would, and, but that means doing the hard yards of actually clearing the backlog. 166,000 on that backlog. The result of that backlog is people are in hotels and inappropriate accommodation, costing the taxpayer over £6 million a day. So we've got to get the backlog sorted out. And rather than gimmicks and bringing in new legislation that isn't required and having the unethical, unworkable and unaffordable Rwanda policy that clearly isn't going to be the returns deal that the, the government keeps talking about. They keep talking about returning people to safe countries, but when we left the European Union, we, we left the Dublin Convention, which was about enabling us to return uh, asylum seekers. It didn't, it didn't uh, work. The, 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 the Dublin botched, agreement didn't work. The botched Brexit deal that Boris Johnson did took us out of the Dublin Convention. We've got no returns agreement at all in place now. So where are they going to return these people to? Okay. We've got to get a okay. deal in place Stephen, and we've got to clear the backlog. The Dublin agreement, and by the way, under the Tories, they, 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 downgraded, let, let they downgraded the Home Office officials that used to be reviewing asylum cases from £40,000 a year to £25,000 a year. The result of that is you get less experienced people with less expertise taking decisions on cases okay. that are more open to appeals, thus adding to the backlog. It is a complete and utter shambles. 13 years they've had to sort this out. It is completely unacceptable. Very briefly on the Dublin Look, Convention. Uh, under the Dublin Agreement, which was the agreement that we had with the EU, less than 1% of the people who we asked the EU to take back ever went back. So how are you that, going to do that, it now, that, then? That didn't so work. So how will you return to what, those what, countries now? Because what, what we're going to do is different we are going to remove people to a safe third country, wow. like Rwanda, so that you break right. the incentives okay. Okay. on so the it's people's a, it's it's a so that people don't come across the channel illegally. Right. It's so amazing without, without you can that. still say Rwanda with a straight face. I mean, that's a, well, an extraordinary achievement. Why, why do you say that? But deporting people to the scene of a former Holocaust still strikes me as a bit well, tedious. Ian, 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 the High Court, yes. before Christmas, yeah. studied all of our plans yeah. and studied the situation in Rwanda yeah. and concluded not only was Rwanda lawful, yes. but was our policy lawful, yeah. but Rwanda is a safe country. It's right. not a you safe country, that? it's just about to go so to so war you, again. You, you disagree with the High Court, do you? Yes, I do, because oh. Rwanda is, is about to go to war again with its, one of its neighbours, the DEC. It's not safe. And, and all this talk about processing people, I mean, peas get processed, peoples don't get, people don't get processed. I find that truly offensive. <laughs> There's lots of hands up. Let me hear from some of you in the audience. Right, the guy, the man in the blue shirt with the glasses, yes. Um, yeah, this, this, this issue of unauthorised channel crossings obviously hasn't just started. It's begun on for some time. And Mr Jenrick said it's vital to get a grip of it. And, and to bring it down to a sort of binary question, why hasn't the government... Is it that it can't, and there might be very good legal reasons or whatever it can't, is it because it can't or because it doesn't want to? Now, there's, there's all sorts of sophisticated things behind that, but it does seem to me to be a binary choice. Can't it, or doesn't it want to? OK, I'll come back to you, Robert. I just want to hear a bit more from the audience. Yes, the man here in the front in the blue sweater. Yeah, hi. Um, I happen to agree with the bill, 
but how many more hotels are we going to have to fill before we accept there's a longer term problem um, with immigration in this country? We can't just keep putting people in hotels after hotel, especially in this area, we're filling up grade two listed buildings with people, part of the processing issue. Uh, we can't just keep housing people in hotels and expect the problem to change. And what do you think of, of the Immigration Minister's uh, suggestion that we should... I, I if you come over on a small boat, that's it, you won't I, go to Farmers Home. I happen to, I happen to agree with him, yeah. OK, man behind. Uh, going back slightly, are we now saying that Rwanda is safer than Knowlesley? I think you are, aren't you? Well, look, we do think Rwanda is a safe country in the High Court. Is... Safer than Knowlesley? No, 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 no. We're, <laughs> we're saying that Rwanda is a safe country to send somebody. Okay. But look, look, if I could just say... Uh, no, 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 point, no, I'll, no, I'll bring it's, you... it's a serious point. I spent 80% of my days as a Home Office Minister dealing with some of the worst people in society. I deal with human traffickers. I deal with drug dealers. I deal with serious organised criminals. And I can tell you, the only way that we will beat these gangs is by changing the incentives. And for as long as they think that they can put somebody in a rubber dinghy, ferry them across the channel, they will come to the UK and find a life here, then thousands of more people will do that. They'll place their lives in danger. They'll place the lives of children in danger. And we'll feed criminals, the most evil forms of criminals, all over the world as a result. And so, it, you know, you can... You can mock policies like Rwanda, yeah. but, but these are really hard can. choices. These are hard choices. If you want to beat the human traffickers, if you want to stop this industry, you have to change the incentives. Excuse me, has it and ever by doing that, people will not cross the channel. Has it ever they will stay you, in a Robert, safe country like Robert, France. has it ever occurred to you that the reason people come here illegally is because you've closed off just about every legal route? No, that's route? not true. That's not of course true. it is. No, it's not. It's, it's palpably not true. It's palpably not true. Since 2015, 440,000 people have come to the UK on humanitarian visas. Last year, more people came on humanitarian visas than any year since the Second World War. Robert, let me ask you a question so which you're... It, it is a naive argument let me, I, let to me ask say you a question which that was by increasing Robert. safe and legal routes will stop the problem. Let me ask you a question which, you which your colleague put to, uh, to Suella Bravman, mm -hmm. the Home Secretary, which she was... She was she struggled to answer, I think it's fair to say. And he asked, I'm, just because this comes to your point, I'm a 16-year-old orphan from an East African country escaping a war zone and religious persecution. I have a sibling legally in the United Kingdom. What is a safe and legal route for me mm. to come to the United Kingdom? Mm. What's the answer to that? Well, the answer is that we do have safe and legal routes that are available to people in, all over the world. From, if he comes from an East African country, where, where we, would that we be? We have, for example, a community resettlement scheme where people can present to the UNHCR and through that find a passage to the UK. Because the Permanent but, Secretary said he accepted there are some countries where that would not be well, possible. Well, that's where there wouldn't be a reason because the UNHCR don't have operations and wouldn't consider those people to be refugees. But in a sense, I disagree with the premise of your question. Well, it was, it was your Conservative the, colleague's the question, UK, in fairness, not mine. The, the UK has finite resources. We cannot offer safe passage to anyone from any part of the world who wants to come to the UK. I've already said that we are one of the most generous countries in the world, and I refuse... You take far fewer than most people in most no, countries no, in that Europe. No, that's not Absolutely. true. That's not true. Look it at the Homes true. for Ukraine scheme, which is the first but anniversary over, You know, of. Robert, you We've know, overall the, number the numbers people, are... are, are uh, overall, the numbers are but, And the, and the gentleman in the audience the perfectly understandably said that he doesn't want to see more hotels being filled with asylum seekers. I don't either. Okay. I don't think people do. We'll process so we them quicker to, we and then let them clear the backlog. We have to be honest clear about the, the pressures that we have as a country and to focus the resources we have on those people who need it most. And to me, they are people like families with young children. They're people like countries for whom we have a particular historic and, and, and moral obligation, like Hong Kong. They're places near to us, like Ukraine. We cannot just have an open-door immigration policy to anyone from anywhere in the world. And I think, in honesty, that is what Stephen is suggesting, <laughs> that we open our doors, we let millions well, of Stephen, people... Well, Stephen, let me ask. Stephen, very briefly... Precious resources. Lana, I'm going to come to our promise. But very briefly, what would your answer be to Tim Loughton's question? 
So let the, let, let the child come in. So safe and legal routes are required. And the yes, we've got Ukraine, Hong Kong, and Afghanistan. By the way, the Afghanistan program is not working but briefly, at all. Briefly, because I want to bring Lionel in. We Would you create more a, safe routes? We need a proper deal with the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, which enables people okay. to report safe, through safe and legal routes at the country of origin and to find a safe okay. way to the UK. One final no, no, point no, on no, Rwanda. No, I'm going to bring Lionel. Let me bring Lionel. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there are two big poll factors for this country. One of them is that we have a non-contributory uh, welfare system so that uh, you get access to the NHS uh, and housing support, et cetera, without having paid a dime into the system, or 10p. Um, but the other one is obviously that uh, you're uh, in like Flint. If you get here, you don't, you, you're, you, you get to stay and word is out. All these people have smartphones. Um, and the only thing we can do really is uh, to withdraw from the European Convention of Human Rights. Now I know that for the Tories that's very awkward. It doesn't, it's not a good look. But uh, this and two or three other treaties uh, are completely tying uh, the ju judicial hands and all these human rights lawyers who basically believe that the UK doesn't have the right to reject anyone who wants to come here. They believe in open borders. And, uh, you know, with appeal after appeal, nobody gets sent back. And that's what's wrong with the Rwanda idea. Uh, Rwanda was, was conceived, of course, not because it's a safe place to be, but because it's far away and because it's where these people do not want to be. So that's the whole point of it. It's, it's meant to be, uh, it, it's meant to mean that, that two friends part in Calais and oh, we'll see each other in uh, rugby. Um, and, and then it turns out that the next call is, is from Kigali. So that's a big discouragement. And I don't know whether it will work, because if we never end up legally being able to deport anyone anywhere, so much for Rwanda. The Rwandan government has said it can take a maximum of 400 people. Let's it doesn't even begin audience. to scratch the surface. Yes, um, th I'm trying to get to you. Yes, the woman here with the glasses. So you talked on, on and on about safe and legal routes, but they're closed to people from so many areas. Um, I actually live a mile and a half from a hotel which has got almost 200 asylum seekers. A number of them come from Tigray in northern Ethiopia. There's been a war there the past couple of years with over 600,000 deaths. There's been war crimes. It's potentially a genocide, but certainly there's been ethnic cleansing. How could someone from Tigray come to the UK through a safe and legal route? Right now, there's nothing for them. OK. The man there in the glass and the blue shirt. Uh, Robert said um, you don't condone anyone breaking the law, yet you sit there as the immigration minister allowing thousands upon thousands of illegal immigrants coming to the country every single day. And you've been a part of successive Conservative governments over the coming years. So I, d I just don't understand how you can say such things. OK. And the, the man in the middle at the back in the pink shirt. Uh, it, it sounds like the usual blah, blah, blah from the minister, always telling us what they're going to do but not getting round to delivering it. What I don't understand about government policy, and maybe you can answer it tonight, why are you allowing in 40,000 people a year that we may not need and refusing to bring in lorry drivers, construction <laughs> people, fruit pickers that actually we do need? And telling retired people to get off the golf course and get back into the employment is not going to solve that problem. OK. Uh, yes. The man there with his hand up. You talked about coming from a safe country. What about those from Ukraine? Surely they've come from a safe country as well. Sorry, just say that again, Mr. Beginning. Yeah, Mr. Jenrick talked about um, asylum seekers coming from a safe country that they shouldn't be allowed. But what about the people from Ukraine? They're safe countries around there as well. Oh, so you th you're not, I see. You're not suggesting that Ukraine is safe, but they could go to countries near them, which, yes. of course, they are doing in, in, in large part as well. Do you just want to answer that, 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 that man's question, that point at the back? that you're letting people come over, well, you don't want to, but more people are coming across in small boats. And what about getting people into, you know... Well, look, we don't, we don't want people to come across in small boats. I think I've made that, that very clear. And our, well, he's saying, our objective why won't you let more is, is people to stop in. the boats. Why won't you let well, more people in to fill the empty jobs? Well, we have done, is, is the answer there. Last year, net migration was over 500 
thousand in this country and so very large numbers of work visas are being issued more than we've issued in the past I don't think that the problems that we face in the labor market will be solved simply by importing more and more foreign labor I think we actually have to be asking our own companies to invest more in their workforce to train people we have to improve the level of vocational and technical training which we're doing for example with T-levels and apprenticeships and okay. I do think we need a welfare system that encourages people okay. into work because we have six or seven million people who are economically inactive and okay. it's going to be by tackling that that Let we boost our in. economy rather than simply reaching for foreign labour at the first 13 resort. years to do. I'm going to move on but I'd like to hear from you before I do. Oh, just um, the um, uh, the gentleman said is is nosily safe and that was the original question is that the government puts asylum seekers in places um, which are already deprived quite often because it's easier and cheaper. It outsources them to companies who run them very badly for profit. There's no warning a lot of the time. The hotels just spring up. The reason people are in hotels and hotels for so long is because the backlog is so enormous. And people are there for, you know, months and years. You say you'd like them not to be. Well, that, they are. That is why they're there. And to blame the people in the hotels and the hostels for being there when the system has completely failed seems to be encouraging people to go round there with hammers and smash up police cars and say, it's your fault you're here. It seems to be encouraging the sort of reaction that social media and the various sort of lunatics um, uh, who follow that stuff um, take as read. And I think all of those factors mean you've just got to do better. Okay. Well, can I can I say, answer that? Very briefly, I, I Robert. I could not have been clearer in answering the original question that there is no excuse okay. for mm. violence and the kind of scenes we saw in Nosley. But if you believe in borders, then you have to say that if people come here illegally in small boats, that is criminality. They might also be vulnerable people, mm. but it is criminality and we have to stop it. All right. I'm going to move on. Let's take a question now from Carol Garfield. Um, councils are reported to be increasing council tax by up to 5%. If we can't afford the cost of living now, how do they expect us to pay this as well? Is this something you're, you're worried about, Carol? Yeah, absolutely. And what's the impact going to be on you? Well, um, we, I've uh, just bought a, a house, um, we've got a mortgage, and we're looking at the moment now the interest rate going up. Um, everything's gone up from the um, electricity bills to um, food bills, everything. And it, we're really worried about it at the moment. And I know a lot of people are as well, especially the elderly and especially the young families too, that have had um, gas meters put in um, for them, that they've got to put money on the cards. And, yeah, it's, it's across the board now. Stephen. Well, it is a real worry and the cost of living crisis is biting right across the country. Uh, and, you know, when you look at the news today that uh, Centrica reporting profits of £3 billion um, and you look at the fact that the government is failing to put a proper windfall tax uh, on those energy companies, uh, which Labour's been calling for for over a year now, uh, you really do begin to wonder about the priorities of the government. So, do, I think so we do, you, need... do you think that councils should not be allowed to put up tax, council tax by 5%? Which well, is obviously what the government has now allowed them to do. Well, because of the uh, broader impact on the economy, the amount of revenue coming into the council from a range of other sources, including, of course, the impact of the massive cuts to local authority budgets that we've seen since uh, 2010, they have no choice but to do it because councils somehow have to balance the books and they have a statutory du duty uh, to manage their debt. Um, there's a broader picture here which is about having a central government which is actually on the side of local authorities. Uh, that means a central government that taxes the energy companies properly, close the tax loophole, backdate it to when Labour was calling for it and you generate £13 billion based on the profits of these companies in the UK. This is not global profits. And then you need a proper growth strategy. You need to look at Labour's Green Prosperity Plan, which will invest in insulating homes. 19 million homes would be insulating, insulated, saving £1,400 off the average uh, uh, family's energy bill. Uh, you need investment in green energy, 
uh, doubling the amount of offshore and uh, onshore wind so that we can actually then generate the kind of revenue and the kind of growth and the kind of jobs that you can raise a family on. So there's a bigger picture here, which is about a proper growth strategy, but it's also making sure that you take the right political choices. And one of those clear choices is that these energy companies that are raking in profit okay, from the war, these one. are the windfall, this is the windfall of war. They're making profits off the back of what's happening on Putin's barbaric invasion of Ukraine, and that's why they need to be taxed properly so that we can use that money for ordinary working people. Lung. Okay, I don't think an energy windfall tax is going to bring down this woman's uh, council tax. Well, it's, um, it's, it's, the budget is connected, uh, Lionel. You know, there's the central government. And yes, local everything government, is and connected they, yeah, with everything. Yeah, great. Um, Thank, thanks but for but this is, the council tax is just more evidence of inflation. All of the uh, expenses for councils have gone up. They have to cover them. They've, also, like, had a decrease, they've also had a decrease in their funding. I mean, uh, central government grants, which is the, the amount of money that, yeah. that the government gives to local authorities, was cut by a 37%. Well, all levels of government are suffering from the same inflation that they caused. Okay, so, and that's, the, that's why inflation is so pernicious, is that it develops momentum and it gets impl implanted in everything. It's not just a wage price spiral, but everyone's costs st start going up. And, you know, I shop in the same shops you do, and I'm absolutely appalled. And, I, I, and it's not just uh, 10%. It's often 50 or 60%. Uh, so I know r it's easy for Rishi Sunak to get up and say, oh, you know, we need have to t tame inflation, but it's, it's no joke. And it's a monster, and it's very hard to stop. Okay. It's the man there in the glasses, the blue sweater. I agree with Mr. Kinnett's view. I think we do need to insulate. The problem we have is you need to plan for the future. Mm. So the situation we have now is you need people with those SME knowledge and skills to go in and do solar insulation, look at heat pumps. Now, there's two issues there. There is getting those products, and there's fitting those products with the resource capacity we have in the country, we just don't have those skills. So look, I would love to get solar in my house. The problem I have is it's going to cost me about £11,000. Can I get a loan for that? I'm not sure I can because I've got a large mortgage. So what, how would the government enable people like me to go and get those bits of solar in my house to enable me to be more efficient but also save me some money in the long run? So what would the Labour government do to help me in my position? So Labour's Green Prosperity Plan includes a big chunk of funding for insulation. The, so what would you, would, to him based specifically, on, yes, what would you do for him? Based on government, government grants to support, on a cost-sharing basis, uh, the insulation that's required. You're right okay. that the abject failure of the government to plan for this and to create the capacity and the and capability... And he's asking what you do. To, yes, yeah, but that's what we are going to have to play catch-up. So... Uh, when we take over, which I obviously so what hope you're saying, just to be clear, what you're saying is you'll give him some of the money. Yes, right. there is a okay. funding uh, model in right. place to make it gotcha. happen. That 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 was a when we take over. Can I just record that for posterity? Okay. All right. <laughs> Front foot confidence. The, <laughs> the man there. Yes, I can't quite see what you're wearing. You've got a blue shirt on. Yeah. With the addition of a windfall tax, will it or will it not encourage businesses with big budgets to try and avoid tax or move elsewhere? All right, listen, I'll come back to you, okay. because I want to get around the rest of the panel. There was a woman right at the back who had a hand up. Uh, yes, there you are, I can hardly see you, yeah. Um, I think hard-working people really are struggling, and it's not something that we should just laugh at or, or ignore. Um, so I think the knock-on effect of that is people are going to be going on the welfare system because there is no incentive to work. What, what, what has the government got in, in plans for that? Robert? Uh, well... Of course, people are suffering right across the country. I'm sure they are here in, in rugby as well. And it's for that reason that we've consistently tried to take steps to help as many people as we can, and particularly the most vulnerable in society, whether that was the work that we did during the pandemic, helping those people who were uh, out of work or at risk of being out of work through the furlough scheme, or more recently with the support with energy bills. But I won't pretend that we're capable of insulating everyone from these massive global pressures. Inflation, as Lionel said, just is the great evil here. It is very pernicious. It's harmful to everyone in society. And it has to be at the absolute heart of our economic policy to bring it down. 
I'm pleased to say that it is starting to fall, but it remains both very high and in some aspects like food, which of course hits the hardest people, the most vulnerable people in society the hardest, it remains stubbornly high. So we're going to do everything that we can as a government to bring that down. The Prime Minister said it as one of his objectives for this year to halve it uh, over the course of the year. And we don't want to take any decision that might okay. jeopardise that. O on the question on council tax, we're not mandating councils to put up council tax. We understand the pressures. We're giving them the, we the, understand the, the pressures they're under. To do but we're giving them the flexibility to do that if they want to or feel they have to. Some have chosen not to. I've seen in the last week a number have chosen uh, to continue to freeze council tax. Uh, but some have done. And I understand that that is a product of, of inflation. I would take issue with what Stephen has said about cuts to council budgets and so on. In, in my almost three years as local government secretary, time and again, I saw some of the most egregious examples of waste in Labour councils that I've ever seen in my life. In Liverpool, in Slough, How about in Croydon. Croydon. In Croydon, Thurrock, in Nottingham, they're Tories. Uh, Thurrock is a bad example. Um, <laughs> Thurrock is a bad example. <laughs> but, the, but the general point is, the general point is, is you, true, Ian. It's one no doubt private eye specialised in in exposing that these were really appalling examples of mismanagement. There are better ways of running local okay, councils, well, let's, let's and there are in. ways of trying to alleviate the pressures on local communities. Ian. Yeah, I was just going to say, and that, one of the problems local council face is, is they are desperately short of money. There's a, a £3 billion budget shortfall. So local councils start thinking, how on earth do we raise money? So they start trying to become property developers or energy companies. And it's just amazing um, what some local authorities have tried to do to raise money. And they failed abysmally. This isn't their job. Um, and the worst of them have gone spectacularly bankrupt. Yeah. Now... Uh, Michael Gove, of all people, said there were significant failures in local leadership and in financial management, and that's of Tory councils. And the people who failed the most are allowed to put up the council tax the most. So they don't stop at 5%. It'll be above that. It'll be 15%. It'll be um, 10%. Well, Croydon, for example, has increased their rates by 15%. Yeah, and they're spectacularly useless and terrible. spectacularly bankrupt. All I'm saying is there is incompetence here as well as underfunding. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm very grateful for the plug for the Rotten Boroughs column. In, uh, <laughs> in, case, uh, in case you didn't know. Ruth. Yeah, well, the thing about this is when you, you talk about flexibility, giving councils flexibility, Robert, but actually the flexibility you've given them is to give them less money and expect them to do more with it. Um, now, the 5% has been... Well, it's all taxpayers' the money, five, whether the five, it's central the or The 5% is, is uh, been picked on by, I think, 84 out of 100... 14 English councils, 84 out of 114. So when you say some people aren't putting taxes up by 5%, most of them are. And one of the reasons they are is because they've got a huge... Bur I mean, I'm not at all unsympathetic about the lady talking about the cost of living. Everybody is suffering now, and the last thing they need is a bigger t council tax bill. But councils are stripped as well. They're cash-strapped. They're having to find money for things like social care. And because of the situation across the board, there's more need for social care than ever before and the budgets for social care are getting squeezed and the people who need social care most are not getting it. And the and central government, meanwhile, is squeezing local councils and local councils are not crying. Most of them are not crying wolf. I pay respect to the rotten boroughs who are, are behaving badly, but most of them are not crying wolf. Most of them are in really serious deep doo-doo. I'm going to try and get one more question as we've got 10 minutes, but very briefly, uh, Stephen, windfall tax encourage or deterrence to investment, which is a question you were asking. It, it won't make any difference because these are taxes on the excess profits. So profits that have been created by Putin's barbaric invasion of Ukraine have generated massive profit in addition to what these okay. companies would usually you have been uh, making. So it won't make any difference. C can we have other windfall taxes? <laughs> PPE suppliers? <laughs> yeah. Right, we've got 10 minutes. I want to get this last question, if I can, from Julia. Julia Lynn. One fifth of knife crimes in the UK are committed by children, and knife attacks are up by around 30% since 2010. How can we tackle this? I mean, it's worth repeating that, isn't it? One fifth of knife crimes in the UK are committed by children. We've had a very high profile one 
uh, in the last weekend when I was just looking into this before we started this program that just came on one after another after another just a depressing and, and horrifying litany how do we tackle this Lionel well I would just um, I mean the tools are limited but I go back to old-fashioned policing uh, more police on the streets uh, you know let's let them off Twitter duty and uh, stop uh, prosecuting people for using the wrong pronoun and go after uh, kids who are carrying knives and we probably do have to have a degree of stop and search I'm very uncomfortable with that I, I think it's uh, it's alienating I would find it offensive to be patted down by some policeman, but it can be effective. So that, that, I, I don't know what else. Aside, you know, there's the having more youth programs, uh, but uh, we just heard about how strapped councils are, so I'm a little skeptical on that front. Woman there in the stripy sweater. It, we've, we should be looking at why. Why is it happening? And, and what's um, your view? I think it, it will be partly to do with um, poverty, youth programs, maybe parenting, maybe school. There's a whole societal breakdown in some issues, but we should be understanding why before we can come up with the solutions. I'd be interested to hear what the panel thinks, why it is. Okay, I'll get around the audience a bit more first. Yes, the man there at the back with the, the dark jacket on. Yes. There used to be a time where police prevented crime. They were like a deterrent. I think now they turn up when a crime's already happened, take some notes and you never see them again. I think they're kind of glorified office workers. The lady here mentions the why, right? I think bad parenting poverty has existed for a long time. It's, there's nothing new there, except now the kids have knives as well. So maybe if the police did more to prevent crimes in the first place, um, we wouldn't see this. Okay, and the woman here in the middle with the, with the glasses and the blue and white dress? I think it's heartbreaking that so many of our young people are carrying weapons of any sort, whether that be knives or guns, um, in our schools and on the streets. I think it's really, really important that as schools and education, we get the funding so that we can actually offer the policing programmes and other external agency programmes to support our young people and educate them. It might be parenting, it might be poverty, but we actually need to educate those young people that are carrying those weapons, and that is absolutely vital, and schools need the funding to be able to do that. And you're saying this, are you involved with education then? Yes, like I'm a head teacher. And are you seeing kids with knives in school? Is this something you're aware of at your school? Have within, I put you on the spot Coventry. there? You're looking uncomfortable that question, <laughs> yeah, forgive me. I just, I'm asking, not asking to name names, I just wonder if that was, that was an issue you were yes, aware of. Yes, we have been aware of it and across Coventry, I'm from Coventry, um, across the city. Um, it's a deprived city and it's the knife crime okay on the Coventry Street is really, really sad and it's heartbreaking. Mm. But we need the funding in education okay. so that we can actually start to support these young people, find out the why and give okay. them the tools to get away from knife crime, gangs, etc. that you spoke about so, earlier. So Stephen, it's such a massive question, how do we tackle mm. this? I think the uh, collapse in police morale and collapse in police numbers that we've seen since 2010 uh, has played a big role in this. Neighbourhood policing in particular is vitally important. So Yvette Cooper, our Shadow Home Secretary, announced today Labour's policy on getting 13,000 more uh, neighbourhood police and PCSOs paid for through changing the way in which procurement is done and other cost-saving measures. And that would actually start to get police patrols back into our town centres uh, integrated into the community, working more effectively uh, with young people and dealing with the epidemic of antisocial behaviour. 3,000 antisocial behaviour reports per day in our country. So we need to get policing back up to the numbers uh, that it yeah. needs to be. Uh, we need to have neighbourhood a neighbourhood policing guarantee and we need to be working in the communities and getting the intelligence in the Actually, communities that's required. If, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in everybody thinking that police are the answer to everything, but I have to say that Glasgow had a, a terrible reputation for knife crime for many, many, many years. It was an appalling place for carrying knife, the carrying of knives. They set up a, a violence reduction unit and and what was unique about the violence reduction unit was that it wasn't just about police, it was about police, it was about housing, it was about health, it was a, a holistic look at, at what was happening. And it was so successful that um, 
the London mayor has 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 taken up a very well, similar. The, the, the homicide rate in Scotland more than halved since since this That's violence right. and, and, and was it, established. But it, was, it was very specifically. Uh, uh, as I say, a, a, a holistic approach. It wasn't just a, a, a more police approach, which I think is too simplistic, to be honest with you. But um, all right, well, should, we see, should we see if the government's interested in that? Is that something you'd like to emulate? It, it is, and it's something that we have been doing elsewhere in the country. It, this is a difficult challenge, but it is not insurmountable. As, as you've heard, there are places that have taken action. I represent parts of Nottinghamshire, and not so long ago, Nottingham had a very serious knife crime problem. It's much less so today due to taking the kind of holistic approach that's been described around education, uh, social media, I think, plays a role as well, role models, national and local, and, of course, a role for the police. It is important that we focus the police on the things that really matter, as Lionel said, and knife crime, protecting our children... Well, Lionel is said they need, to be, they need to spend less time on Twitter. I agree. I think you want more common-sense policing. I want police officers to be focused on the bread-and-butter things that affect all of our lives, not on... Twitter and, uh, and some of the more woke issues. I would, if I may, just take issue with what Stephen said, where he said there's been a collapse in police morale and numbers. That isn't true. Actually, by the end of March, there will be more police officers on the beat in this country than at any Replacing time the 20, in history. That you more, cut. more, Stephen. By the end of March, there will be more police officers on the beat in England and Wales, not just than there were when we came to power in 2010, than in any they're time in, in our history. Okay. So I'm afraid that isn't correct, Stephen. You should get they're, the facts right. They're leaving the force in droves. Ian. Um, um, I, I agree. Um, with uh, who? Because we uh, have differing opinions here. <laughs> no, no most, mostly with um, uh, uh, the audience. I mean, <laughs> I, I do think this is um, an issue for... Um, uh, um, a wider approach, um, the police, and I, I did notice the story of, of the London Mayor having to take advice from Glasgow on how to reduce knife crime, which I'm sure um, pleased um, uh, people in Scotland. Actually, we're not hearing you quite as wonderfully clearly as we might, because your, your hands over your microphone. You know, just oh. so you don't fold your arms, that's all. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> it's a defensive position. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Excellent. Well, don't bother, I haven't got anything to say. <laughs> OK, on that note, the woman here with her hand up in the grey jacket. I don't think the response to all of this type of treatment around knife crime should be the police. I think we need to engage with community leaders such as sports mm. coaches, youth workers. And I did a, a, a brief stint uh, for a charity business in the community where, frankly, I learned an awful lot from lo local community leaders. And the MP, which shall remain unnamed, was very disinterested. And that, for me, is at the heart of why we've got this breakdown between our, our young people you in this country. You can name names. You're among friends. <clears throat> Liam. And his labour. Right, OK. <laughs> he wasn't really I'll just remember what I had to oh, say. Oh, go on, go on, Gregory. You've got a minute left in. Oh, good. I, th I think the opposite of effective policing, effective dealing of knife crime, is not let's not be woke. I think that's just a really um, sort of diverting and sort of pointless response. Mm. Um, it, it deserves better than that. They, they, aren't, they aren't polar opposites. All right. I've got 20 seconds left. We're going to hear from this man in the glasses in the jacket point about the council tax being pulled up by five uh, percent. Oh, hang on, we're talking about knife no, crime no, now. No, you no, I'm, I'm going on to okay. it, Fiona. Um, in the Neaton, where I live, they're actually just turning the lights off. So going back to knife crime and feeling safe, walking down just an, a general road or high street, I, I'm not saying that's why it's happening, but it, people are becoming more... Um, worried about going out and right, because and the, the streets are dark. It's, the streets are so much okay. darker. I don't know about in rugby, but certainly in the neat and <coughs> certainly are. That's what you're noticing. All right. Well, thank you for that. Our time is up. Our hour is over. My God, it goes quick. Yeah. Don't you think? Thank you very much to the panel, to our audience here. Thank you very much for coming along and putting your point. And of course, thank you to you at home for watching. We are in Cardiff and then Sunderland. So do go to the Question Time website if you want to be part of that audience. And don't forget, if it's too late to watch us after 10 o'clock news, we are live on the iPlayer at 8 o'clock every week. From rugby, from all of us here. Until next time, bye bye.